you know, I, I just make it very, very clear. I'm a clinical radiologist. I'm not an academic. So what I will take you through, hopefully, in this talk is basically the role that the clinical radiologist has in, in the management of patients who present with a potential osteosarcoma. So I tend to divide this into pre-diagnosis and post-diagnosis. So we are responsible at the beginning for characterization, which is based still on the simple plane radiograph. We're then required to stage the disease, which is locally basically for surgical management and then distant for um, chemotherapy and prognosis. Uh, and then we, we do all of the biopsies. So all of the biopsies for sarcoma patients at our service are uh, done under either ultrasound or CT guidance uh, with either GA or a local anaesthetic. And then following uh, diagnosis, um, we don't routinely uh, assess chemotherapy response, but we would res assess that uh, potentially for, for to see if that's going to change the surgical management of the patient, which rarely it seems to. And then following surgery, we may be asked to obviously investigate patients who have a suspected recurrence or any complications of treatment. So as far as the radiological issues are concerned, uh, osteosarcoma, they're very, very classical. In the correct patient age group, an aggressive metaphyseal destructive lesion with mixed lysis. Uh, sorry, uh, wrong button. And bone formation, as you see here, and a Codman's triangle. This is all very, very classical for osteosarcoma. Uh, occasionally, in about 13% of cases, it's said that they can be purely lytic. But again, in the correct age group, you know, this is a young child with an unfused epiphysis yet, and a lytic metaphyseal lesion, which is aggressive in its appearance, that's, that's most likely going to be an osteosarcoma. And occasionally, that can be purely um, uh, osteoblastic, as in this patient here. Now, just... For interest, I've just put some data here. These are 391 patients with uh, appendicular bone tumours that were referred to, uh, to me for biopsy from October 2016 to current. And my, my interest was to make a radiological diagnosis at the time of referral and see how that compared to the histological diagnosis. So out of these patients, we had um, 21 who I made a radiological diagnosis of osteosarcoma based on the X-ray. And that was histologically confirmed in 27, uh, and only one turned out to be a Ewing's, which had an unusual ossified extraosseous mass. So the plain film is very, very good at making a diagnosis of osteosarcoma. In five further cases, osteosarcoma was included in the differential diagnosis, and that was confirmed in two-thirds of those patients. Looking at this the other way around, um, in that group of patients, we had 32 histologically confirmed high-grade central osteosarcomas, of which I had considered them to be that on the plain film in just over 80%, but also the, included in the differential diagnosis in the other three patients. So radio, radiology is very, very good at making a, uh, a suspected diagnosis of osteosarcoma. Now, when we talk about staging, uh, we divide this into local and distant. Local is intraosseous for the primary tumour and skip metastases, which I'll talk about in a little bit of detail, which allows us to identify where the surgeon needs to make his... Uh, uh, osteotomy uh, to resect the bone. Extraosseous staging is to look at its relationship to neurovascular structures to see if limb salvage is possible or if amputation w is required. Uh, assessment of the adjacent joint is some data I've got on, which is again there in red, and then the assessment of the associated muscle compartments. Distance staging, all patients have an unenhanced chest CT, uh, and then either a bone scan, but more and more now, whole body MRI. And just the question about FDG PET, which I'll talk about at the end, because we don't have personal experience of that at Stanmore, but uh, I've got a couple of um, uh, studies which I can just deal with at the end. So local staging is a simple coronal T1-weighted spin echo sequence. Uh, in a longitudinal plane, we choose coronal. Uh, and that has a very good uh, correlation with uh, with the macroscopic extent um, on pathological resection specimens, and that's been known about for well over 20 years now. Uh, we do a T2 sagittal sequence, which is helpful for identifying areas of necrosis where you can avoid those at the time of biopsy. Uh, and then we must have a coronal uh, T1-weighted whole bone MRI, at least a T1-weighted sequence. Sometimes we add to that, but as a minimum, uh, a coronal T1-weighted sequence to exclude a skip metastasis. So in this case here, the remainder of the bone uh, is clear, so we can say that there's no skip lesion. And this is a patient, in fact, with a high-grade spindle cell sarcoma in the distal femur with what appears to be a skip metastasis in the proximal femur, which completely changes the surgical management in that case. 
And this is another patient with a large distal femoral osteosarcoma invading the joint with epiphyseal skip lesions and also a transarticular skip metastasis. Now again, this is some data which we'd collected uh, over a period of about uh, 12 years. In 202 cases of major long bone osteosarcoma, uh, we identified skip metastases based on coronal T1-weighted whole bone MR in about 15% of cases. They were either single or multiple in about equal number of cases and occurred in the same bone in about 70%, were purely transarticular in about 13% and involved the same bone and across the joint in about 16%. As far as the different bones are concerned, um, skip mets, it seems to be the tibia seems to be the commonest bone um, to have a skip metastasis, followed by the femur. Whereas if we look at the skip metastases, the majority of them, almost 60% occur in the femur uh, and a third in the tibia. For some reason, the humerus is not often involved. We had very few cases of radius and ulna, but just a note, I think it's important to note that the fibula, we saw two cases of skip metastases within the fibula. So whichever major bone is involved, we must image the whole of it to, um, to identify or exclude skip metastases. Now, I think it's fair to say that um, we really don't know what the true sensitivity and specificity of MRI is in identifying skip lesions because uh, the majority of these are not identified or not reported on the resection specimen histology. It can be for a variety of reasons. Uh, and certainly we don't biopsy them routinely unless they will make a major difference to surgical management. So some of the questions that came to my mind regarding skip metastases. Firstly, what is the sensitivity and specificity? I don't think we can actually truly uh, determine that. Does a normal whole bone MRI exclude a skip metastasis? This is something that's worth thinking about and I'll talk about data we've um, looked at already. And these are some of the projects which I hope to do during this next year, whether the presence of skip metastases are predictive for distant bone and chest metastases, whether they are predictive for chemotherapy response, and then also whether they are predictive for a poor outcome. Now, when we look at the first question, we've looked at um, 95 uh, major whole bone uh, patients with um, osteosarcoma. We took it only up to 2013 so that we have a five-year follow-up. Um, about just over 8% of those patients had skip metastases. The osteotomy was then planned on the pre-chemo whole body MRI, which included any skip lesion. And we showed that at five years minimal follow-up for those patients who survived, that the resection margin was clear in almost 98% of cases, and that there was no local recurrence in the bone of origin at a minimum of five years follow-up in almost 99% of cases. So it does appear that the whole bone coronal T1-weighted sequence is a safe and reliable technique for planning the osteotomy site. Moving on to uh, local staging, then extra we, we use PD and fat-suppressed PD-weighted sequences. This is distal femoral osteosarcoma, uh, surrounded by what we seem to be the raised periosteum and clearly separated from the popliteal vessels and the distal branches of the sciatic nerve by a clear flat plane. In this case, uh, of a proximal fibula lesion, there's encasement of the trifurcation and the anterior tibial artery. So this patient's probably heading for an above knee amputation. We look for joint involvement, which is most commonly through the intercondylar notch, again on a T1-weighted or T2-weighted sequence. Very, very rarely we may see uh, involvement of the local lymph nodes, typically in osteoblastic osteosarcoma. I think some of the things we need to consider is um, how... Um, the extros is staging can predict uh, the reliability of lymph salvage uh, in terms of the development of late local recurrence. So again, that's something we would be able to do by looking at our cohort of patients. But one thing that I think is, uh, is interesting is the assessment of joint involvement. Uh, there's very really little written about it. Practically everything that has written, been written about it has suggested that MR overestimates uh, involvement of the joint. Uh, so we looked at uh, our extra articular resections over a 10-year period. Uh, and out of those patients with osteosarcoma, 16 had had an extra articular resection based on the pre-chemotherapy MR suggesting that the joint was involved. So there either was a fracture in the joint or there was clear tumour extending into the synovial space. Uh, and that's the, the range of patients we had there. And when the resection specimen was reviewed, 50% of the patients had tumour in the joint, 
Seven had tumour in the epiphysis, but not in the joint. And one patient had no tumour at all within the periarticular region. So that's very interesting. So I think we need to do more at identifying the um, criteria for joint involvement in osteosarcoma, because clearly we are doing too many extra-articular resections. As far as distance staging is concerned then, as I mentioned, a non-contrast chest CT, this is an unusual case of a large osteoblastic proximal femoral osteosarcoma with um, osteoblastic metastases in the mediastinum and above the diaphragm, as you can identify also on the bone scan. Traditionally, uh, bone scintigraphy has been used for many, many years for staging the skeleton. So in this case here again, primary tumour here, we see metastases, metastases, metastases in the spine as well. Uh, so scintigraphy has been the standard for uh, assessment of um, the skeleton. Now, for the last probably 10 years or so, in our Ewings in osteosarcomas, we've been doing a whole body MRI with coronal T1 weighted and STIR sequences. So this is some of the data we have for osteosarcoma relating to patients with major long bone lesions. So this is re related to only humerus, femur and tibia, which is the data we have at the moment. Out of these patients, 75 had only bone scans, 11 only whole body MRI studies, and 72 had had both uh, studies. And we found a prevalence of skeletal metastases in just under 5% on scintigraphy and just under 11% on whole body MRI. And in those patients who had had both studies, only metastases were only identified in a third of cases on whole body MRI, so they weren't seen on scintigraphy. In two thirds of cases, they were identified on both studies and in no cases were they identified on bone scan alone. So this is very, very similar to what we've uh, found for Ewing sarcoma and it does suggest to us that we need to move away from uh, scintigraphy as a technique for uh, whole body imaging for skeletal disease. To finish off then with two papers which are found uh, related to scintigraphy versus FTG PET. Uh, so this looked at 206 patients uh, with stage 2 to 4 osteosarcoma. Um, and this sensitivity, specificity and diagnostic accuracy are given here. So clearly uh, CTPED is more sensitive than scintigraphy, uh, but roughly the same uh, specificity and so on. When you combine the two studies, then you've got a 100% sensitivity. But I think you have to wonder, well, what is the gold standard here? Obviously, they're not going to, you know, we don't know what the gold standard is. So... Certainly, um, scintigraphy, they also identified here in this paper, is difficult to identify um, METs adjacent to the growth plate. But if you actually look at the images from that paper, you could clearly see them. So I don't know who, who um, wrote that paper, but it, they were su suspected on the imaging. This is another patient looking at only 39 patients at diagnosis or first local occurrence. Again, a very poor sensitivity for scintigraphy. So really the question is, FTG PET is clearly more sensitive than scintigraphy and I think the next question we need to look at, potentially we can do that, is the re uh, reliability of FTG PET versus whole body MRI. So in conclusion, um, we seem to be very good at just making a, a basic radiographic diagnosis of osteosarcoma. The identification of the intramedullary tumour extent, including skip metastases, seems to be very reliable on standard T1 weighted MR sequences. Um, Relationship to neurovascular bundle, we, we can clearly tell what that relationship is, but how that then feeds into local occurrence down the line is something we need to look at. We need to improve, I think, in our identification or criteria for uh, what joint involvement is. And I think we have to accept now scintigraphy is not reliable for uh, skeletal staging. The question is whether we move to whole body MRI and or FTG PET. Thank you very much.